Hi everyone, today I'm going to talk to you about mutualism and the ant plants of Borneo. So I'll start off and I'll give you an introduction to the concept of mutualism. We'll talk a bit about the different kinds of ant plant interactions. Then we'll move on and focus specifically here on the island of Borneo and talk about the diversity of ant inhabited plants that we have here. We'll also talk about things that the two mutualistic partners might be trading with each other as part of that mutualism, and also whether or not some partners are better than others. And finally, I'll talk about some research that I've been involved with looking at the impacts of anthropogenic habitat change on mutualisms, and particularly in terms of how that mutual the costs and benefits of that mutualism play out and whether or not those are affected by habitat change. So what is mutualism? Well, at its most simplest, we can describe it as a situation where two species interact and the outcome of this is beneficial for both species. And we can contrast this with some other kinds of interaction, for example, competition. So in competition, a pair of species interact, but the outcome is negative for both of these species. Um, this differs from, say, parasitism, where the outcome is positive for the parasite, but negative for the host. So this is this thinking about positive and negative um, effects on the two species is a very useful way of thinking about ecological interactions in general. Now, as part of this mutualism, species can trade either services so they can do things for each other or they can trade resources so they can give things to each other um, and we, we also get um, adaptations that will sort of that are obviously uh, part of the mutualism itself so um, we'll talk about this later on in terms of uh, ant uh, structures provided by the plants for the for ants to live in um, and we've got, we've got here two different examples of mutualisms. We've got uh, a pollinating insect inside a flower. So here the insect is providing the service of pollination. She is going to take some pollen to another flower and um, that, that's a benefit for, for this particular plant. And the plant is providing a resource in exchange for this. So it's giving the um, the pollinator nectar and also pollen as well so the pollen can act as a resource um, another another example of a mutualism below here are these cleaner rats and these go inside the gill cavities and mouth cavities of much larger fish and they remove parasites and other pieces of dirt so here they're providing a service and they're receiving a resource they're receiving food Finally, the relationship between two mutualistic partners can either be obligate, that means that both of the partners have to, uh, have to be involved in this arrangement for them to survive, or it can be facultative. So that means that this partner is able to survive even without um, being involved in the mutualism. And it's also worth pointing out that relationships can be asymmetric. So for one partner, the relationship could be obligate, and for the other, it could be facultative. Now, this is a, a really uh, sort of classic example of a mutualism. This is the interaction between fig wasps and fig trees. So this is the life cycle of the fig wasp. And we'll start here with the female fig wasp. She's already mated with the male and she wants to lay her eggs. So she's gonna go and find a fig synconium. Now, this isn't a fruit, figs aren't actually fruit. They're actually a collection of flowers, at least initially a collection of flowers on the inside. So the female will burrow her way inside the synconium and then she will lay eggs inside some of the flowers, not all of them, that's important. Um, and at the same time, she's bringing pollen from another fig and she's going to pollinate the other female flowers. So the flowers that had the eggs laid inside them um, these eggs hatch out into wasps and uh, they're eventually enclosed in sort of gall-like structures, whereas the flowers that have been pollinated um, but 
um, but haven't but 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 haven't had eggs laid inside them. Um, they have they, they will have seeds that will allow the fig plant to reproduce, and the larvae will develop into both male and female wasps. The males come out first. And they will look for female wasps and they'll fertilize them sometimes even when they're still inside their galls before they've even hatched out. The female wasps then emerge, having mated with the males. The males die. Uh, they never even get to leave the synconium. And on their way out of the fig, the females pick up um, pollen from, the, from the, the male flowers inside the fig. And then they leave the fig and set off again in search of another synconium. And this is a, a sort of a, a very, very, this is an obligate mutualism. The figs can't reproduce without the fig wasps. And the fig wasps absolutely have to complete their life cycle inside the fig synconium. So this is obligate for both partners. So moving on now and thinking about the types of ant plant interactions you might see here in Borneo. So there are some ants that can disperse plant seeds. The worker ants will pick up the seeds and they will bring them back to their colony. This is a good thing if you're a plant because um, it's often bad to have your seeds right next to the parent plant because then your offspring will compete with you. Some ants that live inside mutualistic plants can actually trim uh, or even attack other plants and they will stop those plants from competing with the mutualist. Ants can also feed plants, so the waste of ants is often very nitrogen rich, and that, that means that they can, they can give food to the plants. Um, often this is through specialist structures on the plant that the ants leave this rubbish of theirs in. We've already, um, we've already mentioned this a bit, but the ants can protect plants from herbivorous insects, from leaf-eating insects. Um, ants don't really pollinate plants very much. That's mainly because worker ants don't move very far. And so um, you're, you're, you're not going to be able to pollinate, to bring the pollen to many other plant individuals. So that's what ants can do for plants. What can plants do for ants? Well, they can provide what's known as extra floral nectar. You will also see this written as EFN, an abbreviation. This is where plants make nectar somewhere outside of flowers, not on the flowers. It can be in a number of different places on the plant. And this attracts ants to it and um, it gives them a source of carbohydrate, it's sugar, basically. The plants can also provide other kinds of food. These are known as food bodies. Uh, these can be rich in lipids and also proteins. Plants can also provide places for ants to live in. So they, they can have sort of swollen stems or leaf sheaths or uh, sort of recurved leaves. There's all sorts of different ways that ants, that the plants can make a home for the ants. And for the rest of this lecture, most of the examples I'm going to give are where ants live inside the plants. And that's my own particular area of research interest. And here on the island of Borneo, we have at least 20 different genera of plants and um, involving 35 different species, all of which are ant inhabited. And the most common uh, group of these really are the Macaranga. So this is a genus. These plants are known as Sudaman in Sabah or Mahang in Brunei. And the ants live inside the hollow stems of the plant. Sometimes the plant grows its stems to be already hollow. Sometimes it will have some pith inside, some sort of soft um, spongy stuff. And the ants will have to hollow this out to make a cavity for them, uh, for them to inhabit. Uh, the plants also provide food as well. So here we can see this recurved stipule on the plant stem, and these are the food bodies on the inside, and this is a chromatogaster ant worker collecting a food body. So the plants give living space and food. The ants protect the plants from herbivorous insects, so from leaf-eating insects. And um, they'll come out and they'll attack any caterpillar, for example, that tries to eat the leaves. And amazingly, some of the so this relationship is so um, sort of highly evolved, I guess you might say, that 
the ants, instead of eating this caterpillar, will take it to the edge of the leaf after they've killed it and just drop it off because the only thing that they will eat is the food that's provided by the plant through these food bodies and this extra floral nectar. The ants will also um, attack and kill vines that are trying to climb up the macaranga. And this is very useful because the, these macaranga are often in very open areas where you get a lot of vines. This um, mutualism is an obligate one. So if the plant doesn't have ants living inside it, then it will die, at least for the species of macaranga that are inhabited by ants. And ants can't live uh, anywhere else than inside the plants, as far as we know. And even if plants are inhabited by the wrong ant partner, so um, for example, there are many different species of macaranga. So if you mix up the partners, uh, the ant partners, then the plants still die. And it's important to understand about uh, the relationship between ants and macaranga, because as I mentioned, the macaranga are a group of plants that come in very early during forest regeneration. And this is an example from the roadside near Maliao Basin. And these are all macaranga plants that have grown up after the clearance for the, um, for the creation of the road. So when, um, when a queen ant has mated, she'll fly and find a little macaranga seedling. Sometimes they're very, very tiny. And she'll uh, shed her wings and she'll start burrowing her way in, she'll start digging through the outside layer. The plant doesn't make a hole for the ant, the ant has to chew a hole into the plant. And this is a very vulnerable stage for the ant because she could be eaten by birds, she could be attacked by other ants. So you, you can see that she's rather frantically chewing on the, um, on the outside of the plant to get through to the hollow interior. And this is uh, some time later, and she's made the hole just about large enough. She doesn't make it any larger than she has to. And she's now sort of frantically pushing her way inside. Um, and once she's inside, she'll seal off the hole. There she goes. And she'll seal off the hole, and she'll start producing the first generation of worker ants uh, without having to go outside. So this is called claustral colony foundation for ants. And this is much, uh, this is a safe thing to do for her because she won't be, uh, she's not as likely to be attacked by predators. So now moving on from macaranga to another common ant plant that you may have encountered in the forest here, and that is the rattans. So these are often climbing plants, climbing up into the high into the forest canopy, and they have lots of spikes on, which is probably mainly to protect them against mammalian uh, herbivores. But they also sometimes have ants living inside them to protect them against uh, invertebrate herbivores, things like caterpillars. And I'm going to talk specifically about the rat under the species Corthalsia furtaduana, and these grow ant houses out of leaf sheaths. So you can see here some examples of the different leaf sheaths that grow on the outside. These are hollow and the ants live inside them. They have their brood um, and their reproductors. Their entire colony will be inside the plant, spread out between lots of different leaf sheaths all the way up the vine. And these rattans are mostly inhabited by one of two species of ants in the genus Campanotus. And the research question that we were interested in was um, whether or not the, um, the ants benefit the plant. So effectively testing one aspect of sort of whether or not this interaction is a mutualism. So we can first ask whether or not the different ant species that inhabit the plant are sort of more or less active in terms of going out and walking around on the leaves or patrolling on the leaves. And you can do this just by going and counting how many ants are on the leaves. You can do it, we, we did it for both uh, new leaves and mature leaves because ants often patrol more often on the new leaves because they're more vulnerable to herbivores. And you can see that one species of Campanotus actually patrols a lot more than the other species of Campanotus and more so also than some species of chromatogaster 
that also are sometimes found inside the rattan. And so because this one species patrols a lot more, it seems a lot more active in defending the plant against the herbivores, we're going to call this one the smooth defender and the other one the hairy cheat, because this is a bit more easy to remember than Camponotus species 90 and Camponotus species 93. We can then ask whether or not this, these differences in the amount of patrolling um, have an effect on the amount of leaf damage on the plant of course what we would expect and indeed we find that if you look at how much of the leaf areas are removed by herbivores the smooth for the smooth defender it's not very much for the hairy cheat it's a bit more uh, but interestingly for chromatic aster and for uncolonized plants it's even more than that and significantly more for uncolonized plants so perhaps the hairy cheat isn't really a cheat it's just a bit lazy um, and you, if you're inhabited by uh, the hairy cheat, you're just suffering an opportunity cost uh, of not being inhabited by the smooth defender. But it's still better than being completely uncolonized. We can then see whether or not this affects how fast the rattan grows. And indeed, this is the case. Plants inhabited by the smooth defender grow faster than those inhabited by the hairy cheat. They have more new domitia. So overall we can see that the smooth defender is more active on the leaves it patrols more often as a result of that it encounters the herbivores more often um, and this is the it does this much more than any of the other species that live inside the rattan as a result of this there's less herbivory on those plants and as a result of that presumably there's increased plant growth so we can definitely say that the smooth defender ant and the rattan are involved in the mutualism. The hairy cheat, it might actually also be involved in the mutualism. Um, uh, it's just that it's not quite such a good mutualistic partner for the rattan compared to the smooth defender. Um, and overall, we can see that the rattan is providing the plants, the, the, the ants with housing. And in exchange, the ants are defending the plant uh, from being eaten by herbivores. But what's really interesting is some more work that was carried out just um, relatively recently. And this showed that the ants also clean the leaf surfaces of the plants, which is amazing. So if you look here on, um, on the left of this panel, this is a typical um, leaflet of a plant that's inhabited by ants. And you can see it's all lovely and clean. And this is a leaflet on a plant that's not inhabited by ants. And you can see it's covered by mosses, liverworts and lichens. And this would presumably be very bad for the plant because it would stop it from being able to photosynthesize. So this is a really neat benefit that ants can provide to the plant. And you can see that this would be a benefit for the ants as well, because this will mean the plant can grow larger and the ants can have more living space. So moving on now to a different kind of um, ant plant, or canopy ant plant interaction. If you're out walking in the forest here, particularly in primary forests, you might come across something like this and this is an ant garden so what's an ant garden this is where many different species of plants are all growing together on um, an ant nest that's up in the canopy and the reason that we get this is because ants will go and pick up seeds and bring them back and plant them into their nest and the it's thought that the reason for this is to increase the structural stability of the ant garden so if you've got roots running through you you're probably going to be less likely to fall off and so uh, for the ants your colony is less likely to sort of fall to the forest floor um, there was a really nice experiment carried out looking at this by Doug Yu this is actually in South America not here in Borneo but it's a, a really nice experiment so I'm going to mention it anyway and he trimmed all of the leaves from the plants in the ant garden and he found that these ant gardens survive for much less time after you trim the leaves and that this is particularly true after heavy rain and he speculated that this was because of um, the plant's ability to draw water out of the ant garden when it was very very wet through transpiration from the leaves and this is probably a good thing for the ant garden because uh, for the ant colony because it means that you, you're going to dry out more quickly after rain and you're less likely to fall to the ground in a soggy mess as a result of that. And you, you can also find ant gardens just around here, around um, Kota Kinabalu. And 
this is a um, an ant garden or an ant colony, I guess, that I've been looking at during our family walks over the last six months. And this is in a, a large piece of bamboo uh, for scale. I guess it's about sort of, what, like 12, 13 centimeters in diameter. And someone's obviously um, taken some chops out of this with a parang all the way through to the hollow middle of the bamboo. And there's a colony of diacama ants that have been living in there for at least six months now. And this is a genus that's known to make ant gardens. And that seems to be what they've been doing. So um, you can see here back in January that there's a seedling growing here. There's another one there. Um, a few weeks later, the seedling has got much larger. I'm not sure how well this one is doing. Um, but then interestingly, we moved into the dry season in March and they all died. Um, and it took quite a long time. So here's another image in June and there's still no, still no seedlings left. It start, I think it started raining again, maybe sort of early June here. And now the seedlings have started growing again. So presumably the ants have started bringing seedlings back to their, back to their garden again. But what's very interesting about this is that I don't think that this plant was able to reproduce before it died. It doesn't look like it's grown very large. I never saw any fruiting bodies on it or anything. So um, there wasn't any benefit to the plant of being involved in this ant garden. So I, I wonder whether the ants might just be exploiting the plants in this scenario. Um, and it might not be a mutualism, but rather the, the ants might be sort of almost parasitic on the plants, which perhaps don't get to ever grow large enough to, um, to make seeds. This is all sort of wild speculation because this is a single, a single instance of a, a sort of ant colony observed over only six months, but it would make a really neat research project if anyone was interested in doing it. Another uh, interesting epiphytic ant plant. So this is a, an epiphyte is a plant that lives, um, that lives on another plant. Uh, this is a, these are ant plants in the genus Dichidia, and they form these hollow bulbs and the ants live inside them. And the ants actually put some of their rubbish, their detritus inside these bulbs, and the plant gets lots of its nitrogen, nearly a third of its nitrogen comes from uh, the, the, the ant detritus. But even more interestingly, the plant actually gets 39% um, of its carbon dioxide from the ants living inside it. And this makes sense because the ants are producing carbon dioxide while they're respiring, and the plants need, plant needs carbon dioxide um, when it's carrying out photosynthesis. So in this case, the, um, the, the, this is obviously something that is, um, doesn't really cost the ants anything to make, but it's very valuable to the plant. And that, that sort of situation actually favors the formation of mutualism. And finally, I'll talk about some work that I did quite a while now, looking at another species of epiphytic ant plant, that is um, Asplenium bird's nest ferns. So these are um, epiphytes, they live up in the canopy and they have these broad, simple fronds and they catch falling leaf litter as it rains down and they digest it, they use it as their nutrients and it forms this sort of mossy core down here underneath the frond rosette. And you can get lots of ants living inside here. Sometimes the ants live inside the leaf litter. Uh, this is a colony of Polyrachis doing just that. Sometimes there will be carter nests underneath the fronds uh, most colonies actually live inside this sort of decomposing massive uh, sort of stuff underneath the um, underneath the place where the leaf litter falls in in the core. And sometimes you also get um, uh, ant colonies starting up inside the midrib of the fronds where beetles have um, bored out um, hollow passageways. And the really interesting thing about this system is you get quite diverse ant communities. Uh, living inside even just a single fern. So in this large fern here that we can see, you might have maybe up to 15 different ant species all coexisting together. So the research questions that I'll address uh, here are um, how specific is the interaction between uh, the ants and the ferns, uh, whether or not the ants are able to protect the ferns from herbivorous insects, whether there's a benefit to the ants uh, and whether or not that changes with fern size as a larger fern better for the ants living inside it, and whether or not all of those relationships are altered by anthropogenic habitat change 
so logging and conversion to our palm plantation. So first, addressing whether or not the specificity of the interaction is affected by habitat degradation. Here we've got uh, the specificity of the interaction on the y-axis measured in terms of the similarity of the community living inside the fern compared to that on the forest floor. And so in primary forest and logged forest, we have relatively low overlap between those habitats, so they're relatively specialised communities in the ferns, but in all palm plantation, the overlap is much, much greater. So the interaction becomes less specific in all palm plantation. We can also ask whether or not the ants are giving any protection from herbivorous insects. Uh, that's what's shown on this panel here. We have the amount of herbivory damage on the y-axis and the number of ant species on the x-axis. And you can see that as you have more ant species, you have less herbivory damage. And that's true across all the different habitats. Um, you also find a similar thing if you exclude ants from some fronds uh, and leave other fronds open to herbivores. The fronds that are, have ants excluded from them tend to have more herbivory relative to those that, that, that where they're not excluded. Um, and again, this effect is the same in primary forest, log forest, and in our palm plantation. But interestingly, the ants are not particularly um, aggressive compared to the ants that live inside other kinds of ant plants, where if you even so much as touch the ant plant, these ants will swarm out and start biting and stinging you. So then we can go on and ask whether or not there is a benefit to the ants. Well, of course there is. The ferns are providing somewhere for the ants to live. But as the ferns get larger, what we find is across all the different habitats, this is sort of fern dry weight here on the x-axis, uh, we have more ants, so the total ant abundance goes up across all different habitats. But interestingly, you also find that the number of ant species goes up across all the different habitats. And what that means is um, the benefits to any single ant colony of helping the fern to grow larger are limited because you're not going to end up with a larger colony. Instead, you're just going to end up with more different ant species coming and living inside the ferns. So we can probably think about this system as being a uh, byproduct mutualism. So both of the partners receive benefits, but they're just as a result of the other partner doing what they would do anyway. The ferns have to have this broad rosette of fronds to collect leaf litter and make a mossy core because that's where they get their nutrients from. They're epiphytes, they don't take um, nutrients from the tree itself, they're not parasitic, and they don't have roots going into the ground. So this is their only way of getting nutrients. The ants also need to get their food. Um, they're doing that by going out and just looking for any insects that they can eat. And as a result, they protect the fern from herbivory. So this is sort of a byproduct mutualism. Um, neither of, of the partners have shown any kind of adaptation um, to, to the other partner to, to sort of improve their fitness. And interestingly, the, this byproduct mutualism is not much affected by um, habitat change. The ant species change in the different habitats, um, but the benefits all seem to still be there, even with these different ant species. Um, and that might actually be because uh, the partner, the, this interaction is not very specific. So what have we found? Um, we've seen that mutualisms are interactions where both of the species involved have some kind of benefit. Um, there's a wide range of different mutualisms between ants and plants here on the island of Borneo. And in these mutualisms, the ants and the plants can trade many different resources and services. So things like nitrogen from ant waste, carbon dioxide, protection from herbivory, protection from encroaching plants, and so on. We've also seen that the benefits to the plants um, can be different depending on the ant partners. Some ant partners seem to do a better job uh, of, for example, protecting the plants from herbivores. And finally, for one particular, um, non-specific interaction between ants and birds nest ferns, we've seen that anthropogenic habitat change doesn't much affect this interaction, uh, perhaps because this isn't a very specialized interaction. So it doesn't matter if one of the partners, if one of the ant partners, for example, goes extinct, you can just have another ant living inside the fern. So that's the end of the lecture. These are the resources um, that I've cited during the lecture. So have a look at these 
if you're interested in going into greater detail.